Welcome back to the Untethering Shame podcast, where we explore the many faces of shame and how we can untangle ourselves from its grasp. Today, we're diving into an important topic that affects us all, the restaurant industry. It's an industry that we all interact with, whether you've worked in it, received services from it, or know someone who has. And yet we often take for granted the work and value that goes into it. Today, we're going to take a look specifically at the role the restaurant and service industry plays when it comes to addiction, mental health, and social justice. I know big topics, and like always, our goal is not to try and cover it all, assume the role of spokesman or spokesperson or expert, but to explore with curiosity and experience the ways in which we understand and need to reframe our thinking, actions, and norms in a given context. Joining me today is a powerhouse of a human, Alex Lindenmeyer, chef and co-owner of Short Stack Eatery, a community-driven, independently-owned restaurant in the heart of Madison, Wisconsin. From the first time I met Alex, I was in awe of her energy. She has this incredible capacity to make everyone feel seen, safe, and heard while upholding this no bullshit attitude. She's fierce and confident while maintaining a sense of humility and curiosity. The focus in her organization, as well as in her life, is to turn and face systems of oppression head on, to learn what she can, check and dismantle her privilege, and create space for learning and conversation within the community. So when I thought about the idea of this topic, there seemed no better a fit than her. She's open about who she is and how she identifies and is constantly looking to understand how that impacts the way she shows up in the world. But beyond that, she looks at the systems she's a part of as well to see where drips become ripples that swell into waves of impact, much like our topic today. As we think about the service industry, we know that mental health distress, addiction, systems of oppression, and, and judgment exist. But how often do we lean in to truly consider the impact and what would happen if we showed up not just for the product, but the people as well? Ooh, Alex, I'm like excited, nervous, everything in between. Welcome. Let's start there. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Yes, that was a great intro. I feel jacked up and ready. <laughs> what would you say? Maybe it is jacked up will be your word, but I like to start each episode thinking about kind of where are we at emotionally starting this conversation. So if you could describe where you're at right now with one word, what would it be? Oh, um, one word is excited. Yeah. Yeah. I'm super excited. I've, it's my very first podcast. I'm thrilled. Ooh, I like it. I like having the opportunity to connect with people that I've known in such a different setting. We've worked together in different capacities before I've known you. I've been an admirer of the restaurant, but not like, I love your food. I love the restaurant, but honestly, the thing that has always drawn me, drew me, drawn me, drew me, I think it's drew me to you and your team is that exactly what I said, this idea of just I know there's a lot I don't know. We collectively as a community know there's a lot we don't know, but our job is to continue to ask hard questions and to give people platforms and space and to not try to be the person that now is speaking for all these people and systems, but to open the door for conversation. And so you are somebody I think about a lot when I think about how am I approaching things, when we think about topics like racism, sexism, Like, am I coming at it from a place of white fragility or my own guilt, or am I really Mm. coming at it from a place to be at the table and to learn? And so I appreciate that about you. And if nothing else today, I just want you to hear that and to know that I'm sure there are days where you're not doing it for the credit. It's another thing I love about you. And I appreciate that you do it because it helps empower people like me to continue to show up and reframe the way we think and to take the shame out of thinking that way and to not be like, I'm a bad person because I'm learning mm. and instead be like, I'm a good person regardless. That's okay. I don't need to factor that in and define it, but I can just be a person, an imperfect person and explore with others. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for saying that. I think it's definitely something I struggle day to day with in my just professionally with my team is to try to decipher, differentiate the notion that you want everyone, yourself included, to be able to show up unabashedly and unapologetically themselves. And there's a task at hand, mm-hmm. you know, to the point, to your point of in the intro of like, 
restaurants are such a big part of everyone's life, but nobody talks about them. Like it's such a big part of your life. It's in food service in general, we saw in COVID, it's like, what would you do without the option of going to get whatever kind of food you wanted whenever you wanted? Yeah, It's like such a luxury that we don't want to talk about or pay for or acknowledge that God, you know what it's like for people that, that anytime you want anything, you just show up and we give you whatever you want, whenever you want. <laughs> and then you're complaining because it's not perfectly set up in a certain way. Yeah. Or it's not exactly how you thought it should be or. Yeah, I can, I, I, again, I, jo- I jostle back and forth with, I'm also a diner. I love going out to restaurants. And so I believe in hospitality, hospitality and customer service. I want to be thoughtful about the customer experience. And I want you to have a great one. Yeah. I do think that's our responsibility, even though COVID made us so, so much more exposed, you know, like to your point, this has been this way. COVID didn't just invent these problems in the industry. They've been this way forever. It's just COVID exposed them and we all got to see them. It just, it's just, it's incredible that people don't want to acknowledge, like, do you know what it would take for you to, decide the exact thing you want to eat, to go to the store, to buy all the shit, to bring it home, to make it, to clean up after it, to, you know, you don't want to do it. So instead you go into a restaurant. So you have to start acknowledging that that is worthy of, I think it comes down to, of your money. I mean, in this society, we, we, money is such a big indicator of how we value something. And the fact that people complain or don't want to pay for things to me sometimes is like, it's such a, you know, people are like $3 for a cup of coffee. It's like, yeah, it's a bottomless cup of coffee. You can drink as much as you want. And it's here hot and ready for you in this warm building mm-hmm. whenever you want it. You know, yes, it's going to be $3. It's like people can't, can't gr- grasp the concept or, or put value behind it. And so I love that you thought of this topic specifically, but more broad, the idea yeah. that we want to try to show up our true selves, you know, our, our authentic selves and, and in turn, or in addition, get something done too, you know? Well, I think it's, there's a couple elements of it. I don't want to speak for everyone. And I think I started to really struggle recently. I think there's this, it's probably the next wave of what we're going to see in terms of interpersonal, mental, emotional distress and conflict as we kind of come out of I don't know what stage we're in with the pandemic where I don't think we're out of it, but we're not in it in the same way as we were three years ago anymore. But there's this, it feels like ego driven. It's almost like everyone was so isolated in ways where our social skills and our capacity to show empathy and grace seem, seem off kilter. Again, some people I think are still able to do it. Some people have found balance. Some people are working on it. But it feels like it feels harder. And I, I mean, even <laughs> the first time yeah. I went out, I didn't leave the house for like six months except to take my baby on a walk because I had her and then the world shut down and Jordan was in the emergency department. So I was like, ah, like, I don't know what to do. We're constantly at risk. Like he's showering in other rooms and like, you know, stripping clothes in bags. And I'm like, okay. And I'm not sleeping because I have this kid. And there was a day where he's like, you just need to go see another person. At a safe distance, there was this restaurant that we like that became our place in Portland to go to because their food is incredible in the place, but also at home and really loving that they mastered the art of how to create the quality when you pick it up after it's been sitting for 20 minutes and it still tastes good. And he's like, you go, it's a table. It's right at the door. You're at least 20 feet, but you need to go just say hi to another human. Like you need to function with that. And I remember going up to the door And this person is in the back and they were dancing to Shania Twain, just grooving. And they were like, oh my gosh, can you believe I forgot Shania Twain made a disco song, like just popping, popping around, dancing. And I looked at them and I'm a fucking therapist and I was doing therapy the whole time. Like I was just on the computer. So I know how to talk. I was talking trauma probably two hours ago with somebody, but I looked at them and I was like, huh. Yeah, yeah. I grabbed the bag and I left. And I was like, Jordan, I can't leave the house again. I I've got nothing left. I don't know how to talk to another human in the world. So there's that. There's that difficulty. But the other thing that I think happened is 
we know this just as humans, the more you're in your world, like when we're having, when Jordan works a stretch in the ED and he's not home a lot and things feel hard at, at home with Everly and like having a three-year-old is challenging. I'm navigating these things. If I don't stop to think about what's it like for Jordan to be working overnights in the emergency department, what's it like for, you know, X, Y, and Z, I tunnel down really quickly to my life is hard and Jordan's not doing enough and everything sucks. I think that we have a natural propensity as humans to do that. I think the U.S. sort of cultural norms make it easier for us to do it. It's very individualistic culture. We're sort of there's a lot of privilege in how we engage. And I think that's what happened to a tenfold within the service industry, too, is sort of expectations and personalization. So they they miss something on your order they weren't trying to make your day harder. They're doing the best they fucking can with a million and seven orders coming in. And now everything is a review-based system. And if they get one four-star, three-star, two-star review, you can ruin a fucking business. They are just doing the best they can. But you seethe on that, write a review, and we've lost the grace. And I can't imagine when we think about mental health and well-being, what it's like for people to be in a system that is designed where anything you do you are judged, scrutinized, and made to believe that you are the problem in somebody else's story. That is such a challenging place to be. Yeah, for sure. Especially when we see the restaurant industry being the target of things like internet reviews. It's like you right. don't you don't go into a, a insurance company's office and are like, oh, this carpet is ugly. Like, yeah. Why <laughs> did they hang those pictures on the wall? But like, you'll see the craziest Yelp reviews of restaurants and being like, yeah. I can't believe they chose that color for their bathroom. It's like, what are you talking about? Right. It's just right. the fact that you have access to us, that we're public facing, customer facing, and you get to have face-to-face -face access with our space. And we have to put on a smile and nod and fake it. And mm -hmm. a thousand times a day, a thousand different interactions. And then we mm -hmm. wonder why when we get home, we're so exhausted. Right. And it's, why it feels hard to even have us to be able to name how you feel, put it out there and to feel safe putting it out there because you've been telling yourself you have to put every feeling you have. You're not human. Yeah. You are the human giver. You're this, you are the quote unquote server. And I don't even mean that as like a server in the role, but your job becomes beneath the people in there because you're the restaurant, you as a person all becomes dictated by their perception of you. And that's not fair. We, there's no human centered connection in that anymore. It's an expectation yeah. to be in service to people in a way that is not, that's not what we're coming to you for. We're coming to you for whatever that product is. You are not required to give somebody the 110% all the time you can strive for it. Yeah. But like we as humans miss that step all the time. And if I had a Yelp review for every time I had an interaction with somebody and I got it wrong, like, man, if I got a Yelp review as a mom just in three years, like I'm a good mom. I have confidence. I've worked through six months ago. I wouldn't have said that. I was like borderline, like, I think I'm the worst mom on the planet, sure. but I have since worked through that. But if I got a Yelp review every time my kid was upset with me, I'd have a one star. Doesn't mean every, I'm a bad mom. Every, yeah. Every time your kid <laughs> had an interaction that maybe didn't make her feel the best. Right. Yeah. You that's, put carrots on my plate instead of yeah. tomatoes. One, One star, star review. Yeah, do not recommend. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is that. And it's, I know a lot of folks in the service industry that identify as chef owners that identify as, as hospitality people that really have to work through that, that really have to spend time in therapy and spend time talking about building the, the skill of deciphering the things that people throw at you. There's so much coming at you, both in the restaurant face-to-face -face interactions and on the internet that you have to learn how to decipher which ones of those things are super amazing, incredible things that you can take home and internalize and which one of the things are make you feel uncomfortable, but it's stuff that you should take in and process. And mm -hmm. what's the noise that's just noise and that you don't need to even think twice about, you know? Well, and it's not like, this is something that is developed purely in the restaurant industry as humans coming into the industry. They're probably already struggling with this because I think it's something we all struggle with is like getting feedback, taking in information, knowing what to accept. We're all, you know, our egos are wired to chase the five stars. So if you're going to listen to the five stars, you're inherently at risk of listening to the one star. And it is that piece of 
we can't get to a place of not caring and not being open for feedback. I hate that idea of like, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks about me. Me too. Yeah. That's, that's not real. That's not genuine, but it is that deciphering and it is a decision fatigue that sets in. And again, sort of the rate at which you're having to factor that in, I can't imagine that. Do you think, because I know addiction being a thing that you are really thinking more about as as an owner, as somebody that, ha- you know, your job is to really support your employees, but also just thinking about the industry as a whole. Do you think that that is part of why addiction becomes such a prominent thing is the masking, the coping, the getting through the shift? Do you think it's something else? How do those things inter- intersect? I do think it's such an emotional and nervous system roller coaster being in this industry specifically. I always say it's not much unlike an emergency room. Mm-hmm. Anybody can come in at any time and and anything can kind of happen during a shift. Now, is it with maybe the utter seriousness of an emergency room? No. But the fact that we have to have thousands of interactions with thousands of different people yep. a day and you don't know anything that's going to come at you, gosh, it sure feels like an emergency room during certain shifts. And so that nervous system and emotional regulation ride makes people so your nervous system is so over exhausted by the end that it makes sense that so many people found substance as just purely the protective or the coping mechanism at the end of that to go, holy shit, if I sat and thought about all the things that happened to me today, I couldn't, I don't have the skills to deal. And so I think it just became so normalized after so long, years and years and years and years that Yeah, it's just utter acceptance at this point that it's almost like our brains are trained to have the, you know, the reward system be, hey, hey, work your ass off during the shift. And remember, at the end, you get this reward of of, you know, blackout, don't have to think about, don't have to cope with, don't have to be in this here now. Right. It's the reward at the end. So keep pushing. Right. And then, yeah, at the end, you get your shifty and your 10th one and your 12th one and your, you know, nine lines later, you're. You're, you're definitely not thinking about your shift you just had. Right. And it is. Yeah. I think that that's just how it, it just became normalized like that. It became sexy. Um, and now, yeah, it's the norm and that sucks. You know, that's not the norm in a lot of other industries that everybody together at the end of the shift or the end of the workday is like, man, let's go get lit. Yeah. That's just not. That's not the norm with so many other people's professional, you know, cultures. And it is with ours. So I definitely kind of have had to train myself since owning a business to like think about myself as like one unit. My in the four walls of my restaurant is another unit of like within my professional family. Mm -hmm. And then the third or outer layer is like my community, the shit, the place that I live. It's like, there's a selfishness that goes along with being a business owner in my city. It's like, it's like, yeah, I work at my business. I want it to be good. I work here too. Like mm-hmm. I want this culture to be healthy. I also work here. It's like, there's a selfishness to it. And the same thing with my city. It's like, yeah, I live here. I want it to be, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> I want to like it too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to be proud of it and be in awe of it. Just like anyone else would have there you know, their, their families or their communities or their, or their, themselves. So I think there's a selfishness to try to want to make it a space where sobriety can even be an option for people, you know? Yeah. And the sobriety, sobriety conversation comes so much earlier in, in the lives of so many service industry workers, especially cooks and chefs, because it's just so utterly stressful. So it sucks. It sucks for, it feels, it feels impossible right now. It feels hard. It feels like a lot of people just really want to get fucking sober and they just can't. Yeah. Well, and imagine, I mean, I say this, you knew this obviously years ago when we worked together, but being in recovery from an eating disorder, my mom struggled with a crack cocaine addiction and alcohol. And we talk a lot in our recovery around how hard it was for me because I'm, because you're faced with your substance every day, there's, my mom can design her life to, she's around alcohol because obviously alcohol is a much more normalized drug within our culture. 
but like she has to seek out crack cocaine. It's not a thing. And she doesn't need it to survive every single day. You know, she doesn't have to have it. So one of the things that was really hard for me and that I think a lot about in terms of different aspects of addiction is how is your life design creating barriers and access points for you in your recovery journey? And so one of the really tricky things I think is again, within the food and the, the drinking sort of culture, if you're working in this industry, it's like me having to sit down and eat three meals a day when all I want to do is engage in whatever those behaviors were. And my brain is running on rampant and I don't know how to deal with this yet. They're seeing it constantly. And they might be the one person in their team or on that shift that is considering or wanting or longing for sobriety, but somebody else might not be. Somebody else might be in a very different place or have a different relationship with substances. And it's not just the substances. Cause I think I love the way you talked about that is that's not the problem. It's that's, the, that's on the surface. We need to address it. But the problem is the underlying reasons of how are we normalizing this and what are the different sort of mental factors that we're creating as norms within the system that we're leading to such burnout that this feels like it's the only option. This is sort of the, the, the recourse, or I guess the, the recalibration maybe even after that. And so it's that piece of it. And it's how do you stay in an industry that you want to be in? And maybe for some people they have to be in, but I also think there's, I mean, we could just layer in the the aspects of shame. There's a lot of assumption that working in the service industry is a have to, and it's sort of looked down upon versus it is something that people long for and choose and love and want to be in. It is not the thing that you do just when you're a teenager to get yourself out of it. Like this is a very serious industry. People work really hard at and really want to be in. So then there's this like, I want to be here. I want to create a life. I can be in this, but it feels like my only option is that I can't because there's no system designed for me to be around this where I'm not constantly feeling pulled back in and the culture isn't changing. And I still know it's again, like in the emergency department, Jordan knows he's got to walk in every single night and has no idea who's coming in from where, what's going to happen. He's been attacked. Other people have been attacked. You have to still go back in the next day and do it. And same thing. I mean, the suicide rates, the mental health distress, the substance use issues for people that work in that department, it's it's not dissimilar to what we see in the restaurant industry because it is high trauma that we are not talking about. And in the restaurant industry, it's an accountability, I think a collective community accountability that we're not taking to reframe the conversation. So then the problem just becomes the chef that couldn't handle his alcohol instead of the system that's designing it where this chef decided that that's their only choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so true. Like I identify with that so much of, I chose the restaurant industry over and over again. I continue to choose it. It's my mom to this day. It's like, I've owned this company for 10 years. And my mom this to this day is like, when are you going to get a real job? You know, she wouldn't say that, mm-hmm. but she definitely there, it comes with a lack of understanding, which leads to like a lack of empathy within this industry. And also just like a lack of interest, like you said, of like people kind of have been framed or, or conditioned to think that a restaurant job is something that gets you through college, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, I wish I could say to people like my mom that have kind of, kind of been conditioned to that, that, you know, higher education is the only way to gain the, the skill or the perspective. It's like, gosh, I, I think of myself as so much more insightful and so much more intelligent going through the professional timeline that I've had within the service industry than I ever would be collegiately or like Mm -hmm. in higher academia. And, and not to, not to say that one is better than the other. It's, it's just the idea that like, gosh, I, I consider my training in, you know, intellectual journey here to be to be huge in my life like huge huge so i definitely identify with with feeling like that for sure i think a lot of people look on the the industry which then in turn makes us feel some sort of internalized shame about it mm-hmm. and it, it shouldn't be that way at all like at all so yeah i definitely i definitely feel that and then to your point of not thinking of it as a real career, it's like, that's exactly what me and my business partner went into this project 
being very intentional about like, how do we make mm-hmm. this place a place of employment where you don't think about leaving and you yeah. do think about while I'm here, I'm going to get what I, all that I can get in terms of just like you said, the drips and the ripples and the waves of impact of like, I'm going to take what I learned here and whatever I go on to do, I'll be better for it. I'll be smarter for it. I'll be more aware for it. And so, yeah, I think that it, it, it internal, make, it forces us to internalize a lot of shame about that. And I'm not sure how that part goes away. You know, mm-hmm. people just have to have, people have to be, want to want to be open and understanding of the, and empathetic of the fact that Yes, indeed, our jobs are very hard. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know how that how that changes (laughs) other than other than we live in the world of of digital media. We can be as loud and as. As. Yeah, we can be as loud as we want to as restaurant industry folks and say, hey, everyone, this is this is our experience. And people can like everything people can choose to care or not. Mm -hmm. But it is, I think it is reframing because it's, it's like sheep or cattle. I don't know. We've all been (laughs) herded towards a certain like way of engaging and it's the normalized dysfunction. It's the, you know, everybody can leave. I, I even had this, we, so we bought our house. We have since had a variety of not great, like the house is great. We love the house. Everything is fine, but it's been like, we found out that there's radon. So we have to install like a radon mitigation system. We found out that there was a tree in the back that the previous owners were supposed to take down and then they canceled it because they said they didn't want to pay for it and they would just let the new owners figure it out. So there's been these things that have happened where it's like $2,000 here, $3,000 here, here's this new thing. And every single quote I get, every single interaction that I have, there is a discussion about a review it comes up all the time. And we had a really positive experience with an HVAC team who was just incredible. We had our furnace go out the first night we were staying here. And, Mm. and I am such a high anxiety childhood trauma sort of kicks up of like, Everly's going to die. Like that's where my brain goes. Like we're going to have no heat and she's going to die. Or I'm going to try to put a space heater in there and it's going to start the room on fire. And then she's going to die. And I can't let it go. So I'm aware that I have like this very extreme response. And this person drove from Sandy, which is like up on the mountain after like in the middle of, you know, February, March, where there's still a ton of snow on a Saturday morning on his day off to get over here to help us as quickly as he can. Didn't ask me for a review, didn't ask for anything. And like over the course of two weeks, we worked with him in a variety of ways. And then I said, hey, I just want to let you know that I left a review because I know that's so important. And he's like, can hate reviews. And I was like, I know. And I hate it too. And he goes, you know what I've started doing? I've started going to the restaurants that have the three stars. I've started going to the restaurants that people write these crazy reviews for. And he goes, and before that, I just started reading the reviews. Like Jordan was buying a, a curtain rod and he... I looked at it and I was like, oh, it's only got four stars. And then I read the reviews and I was like, the two people that wrote reviews didn't even read the package. Like it was buyer error. But instead of assuming that, we assume the product must be crap because the review says this, you know, or like I tried a mascara once in like an Ipsy bag, one of those like tester bags you get. I loved it. I went to go buy it. And then I saw the reviews on Amazon and I was like, oh, I'm not going to buy it now. And I was like, wait a minute. What? I tried it. I like it. I give it five stars. And now I'm now not going to give it based on somebody else. And so it's, I think for us, it's the, we need to let go of our ego to stop thinking the whole world revolves around us in the sense of like, we're responsible for everything. We're the ones that do it all. Everything that happens is either because we're the problem or because people are trying to hurt us. Like, that's just not how the world functions. You're not that important. (laughs) And then the second, yeah, exactly. The second part is like getting rid of the group think of like, preach. Like, how do we let go of that? Like, a thousand people might love me as a therapist. That does not mean the one person who maybe I did something to that wasn't helpful didn't like that. That's not important. I'm not saying that, but I'm also saying that like a thousand people might hate me, and I still might have had an impact on one person's life in a really positive way. And so I think it's like allowing the possibility that everyone's experience of the world and the context through which we experience the world is different. And for some people coming in, 
it's the $3 coffee that's going to trip them up. For some people coming in, it's I came in and I expected that I should be able to eat right now because I'm hungry. And you told me there's a line outside and I have to wait 40 minutes. And then it took forever to get my food. And somebody else who I saw get seated before me gets their food before me. So what's wrong with that? And, you know, that piece where the story again becomes about them and how they were wronged instead of seeing themselves as I made a choice. It's not like traffic didn't happen to you. You're a part of traffic. You made the choice to go to the restaurant. Immerse yourself in it. Be a part of the community. Think about how you can connect with the people around you. And so, yeah, it feels like that's what we're missing is, again, like letting go of the ego. Everything's not about us. But then also realizing like it's not all about the they. It's not all about the the collective narrative because that is such it's easily swayed by a few people And if we don't pause to say, how do I feel? What's my experience? We are literally robbing ourselves of our voice and then perpetuating the shame that's leading people to think the only option to get through their day is to chug a bottle of alcohol. And that that is the system we need to change. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. Like to your point about the group think, it's like, how do we get to a mindset where we don't care about what other people think of us, or we want to think independently when we've been conditioned or framed for, for decades now, that the only thing that matters is how other people see you online or how, what they say about how many stars they give you online. If that's the only thing that matters, then how could we possibly not want to be part of the group think and think everything that someone else thinks? It's like, to your point about the mascara, it's like, you other people, the group think out there said, no, the mascara sucks. Right. You know, exactly. The mascara sucks. Yep. It's like, it's like <laughs> how do we get out of that idea of like, fuck, I don't care. I think the mascara is great. That's why I'm going to go to the store and buy it. Yeah. It's like, how do I, I, it's just like an issue I don't see being solved anytime soon. The only thing is that's being reiterated to us is the opposite that like, no, it's really actually important what people think about you because if they don't like you, they could all go on Yelp and write one star reviews. Right. And the restaurant could be shut down. So, right. Well, so then your choice is like, try to get more five-star reviews. So then people are, I mean, I see this in the wellness industry too, of like, leave me a review and you get this free download, leave me, Mm -hmm. leave us a review and we'll give you $10 off the next time you visit. And so it's Mm -hmm. then incentivizing the five-star reviews, which also isn't an authentic experience either. And so it's that there was this article recently too, about this woman that gets all these products and she writes fake Amazon reviews. And like, that's the whole thing she does is just to help promote the products And it's like, I just wish, you know, Jordan and I talked about this. We met in Nicaragua and both from Madison area. So like we came back, you know, in the U.S. existing in this culture we're talking about. But like you didn't go to like the street vendor making, you know, the food that you were going to go get, the tortillas, the pupusas, like anything you were getting. You didn't go up to them and be like, what does it say on Yelp? Like you just went up to the person that was there. You had a conversation. You ordered some food. You enjoyed it or didn't enjoy it. And then you moved on. And like, it just wasn't this thing that you were going to hang everything on. It didn't come with expectation other than just being a part of your day and a part of your experience. And I think that's the part two of like, what if you just, and, and oh my gosh, see, this is where I'm opening this up. We could go for 13 more hours. Here for the, days. Yeah, exactly. But the other thing is like, I think a review timestamps people too. So there might have been a day where you like, I'm sure you've had this experience before, where maybe you had an employee that for whatever reason, either they just who they were as a person, what they were going through in their life context, like wasn't a good fit anymore or wasn't a good fit from the beginning. And you go, gosh, okay, well, now we know. And you have to make those decisions or sometimes people have a bad day. But timestamping somebody or a restaurant to that one experience, that one person, that one dish, that one, whatever it is, I also think isn't fair. And so I think one thing that reviews do too is we we don't look at sort of projection and evolution. Like me as a sort of, I guess, in the wellness sphere, but like from the therapy side and like running a business, I'm, I don't know however many years technically in it. But like, I feel like only in the last year, do I even know what I'm doing? And do I have a product that I think is worthy of a five-star review? Like, I think I've done great things and I've had a great impact, but it's been a three-star or four-star because I'm learning and I want to get better. And so I, I don't, I I just think it's that piece too, of saying like, gosh, some days people are going to try things and they're going to get it wrong. Sometimes that's going to happen too, but it's like, how do we give 
places and people the opportunity to learn and get better versus just everything being all or nothing, yes or no. You know, traditionally it's labeled as black or white thinking, although they're trying to change that that language and that verbiage. But like, I think it's that. And then how do we create human-centered systems that say, it's okay if you don't like that food, don't go back. Yeah. But you don't have it's not, to- It's not for you. Yeah. yeah, but don't use your power in a way that is- hurtful and harmful and, and a response that's outside of the scope of your experience. Like you didn't get guacamole when you ordered it and your whatever the ordering services are that you can like people drop it off DoorDash. They forgot it. Is your life over? Cause you didn't have guacamole or can you just like let it be and be okay? Or, Hey, what if you just told the owner or the manager, like this was my experience. And I just want you to know, because I trust that that's not your intention how different, you know? For sure. Yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to, for everyone to internalize that dichotomy that you've talked about of like, yes, our egos need to be out of the way. And this is ego driven. And yes, you are the center of your own universe at the same time. Yes. You are the center of your own universe <laughs> and you're, and you're in charge of everything in your world and you're not that big a deal. You right. Know? You know? <laughs> it's like both both need to exist at the same time and we need to like, yeah, figure it out that they can coexist. Well, and I think if internally we could all do the work to realize, you know, I wrote about this and I even did a video about it a while ago, but I did get a one-star review on Etsy over a fucking $3 handout one time. And I kid you not, it was within like 17 minutes. I was looking at what are the legal ramifications of pulling out of contracts I'd signed for the next year? Cause I was like, I should shut my business down. Like I'm never going to make it because somebody gave me a one-star review on Etsy. And then I was like, how do I get it down? How do I do this? How do I hide it? What should I do? And I was like, you show up in your values mm -hmm. because I value everyone's right to communicate things. And I can separate, like you said, the noise. And that wasn't about me. That review wasn't about me. If it was, they would have talked talk to me directly. If it mm -hmm. was, they would have followed they up with me. They would have tried to fix it. Yeah. Exactly. They, they would have told me to, what they needed. They would have tried to solve the problem. Exactly. But they didn't because they were just interested in making somebody else feel miserable because they were yeah. feeling miserable. And that is the way that we give power. And as I teach my three-year-old, now that she started watching movies and we've learned that like, we try really hard not to say like bad person or like the villain, but like the person who's maybe not doing the greatest things in the movie. It's like alarming when you realize that all of the movies, when you see kids movies, it's about the people that want power and money. And that's what the ego is striving for is to be the best to be, you know, as Midwesterners playing King of the Hill, like getting to the top of that snow pile, like that is going to be your ego's goal because it says it's the only safe place to be. But you tearing down everybody else means you're going to get to the top of a mountain that's very lonely. Because I think going back, I don't think it's selfish to want to build a community that we can be a part of. I think it's a collective responsibility. It's getting back to collectivistic cultural ideals and norms of you have every right to create a life that you feel seen, safe, and heard in. We also have a certain degree of responsibility and I think excitement to show up and create a world in which we can all coexist and be a part of. And I think that's the thing. We have to be inconvenienced enough to be a part of the solution and to do the work to let go of our own shame, to realize mm. I am not a bad person because one person doesn't like me or I screw up one time. And I don't want to live with that fear that one screw up is going to mean that me as a person and my value and my worth and my ability to be loved is constantly on the chopping block. So I need to stop perpetuating systems that make everybody else feel that way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I mean, we could, again, this is such a big topic and I'm, I'm so grateful. How do you, as we're kind of wrapping up, how do you feel? So podcast number one in the books, how would you describe how you feel now? I feel great. <laughs> this is great yeah there's this ease in your face that it's I mean also I could just talk to you all the time so selfishly I love that we did this just because it gave me an invitation to connect with you again which is wonderful yeah, absolutely. well I will be sure to put links I want everybody to just check out I think the restaurant is amazing if you're in Madison check out short stack eatery check out the other restaurants like Alex said it's there's so many places and support all of them. But one of the big things I want you to 
notice and to see, and we'll put some links to some of the organizations you've supported in the past and you're supporting now. One of the things that I love about Short Stack Eatery is, again, they're not just thinking about how to put, put out an amazing product and support their employees. They're thinking about how to raise up voices and important conversations outside of the restaurant industry and in it as well. So talking about systemic racism and oppression, access to things like bikes for kids that don't have the ability to do, to get a bike or to learn how to ride. There's so many amazing organizations that that whole company is in support of, and they're constantly doing something to bring awareness, money to these different organizations. So check that out too, because I think Alex, you and your team have really figured out a way to blend that, that being a part of the collective voice and responsibility and doing the work. And so Again, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything. If you're listening, be sure to share this episode with someone you think needs to hear it that could resonate with it, help create those ripples so that we can become waves of impact and change so that we are allowing how each one of us feels at the end of every day to not constantly be riddled with or on the cusp of shame and self-doubt. And we'll see you all again next week. 